Welcome back to the Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today we're going to take a look at a pitch deck from Stash Logics. That's a cannabis storage system. To help us do that is Katrina Glugowski, angel investor and attorney. Katrina, thanks for being back on the podcast. Thanks, Josh. I think I've seen this company uh, at a few trade shows. Uh, have you seen this one before, Josh? I've seen their stuff uh, inside of a couple rec shops and head shops between here and, um, and Portland. And I think they're probably still in Vancouver. Yeah, they're all over the place, um, surprisingly. So it's you there. know, kind of, that's great. Yeah. A real product, not an idea. <laughs> and a product that two of the people on this podcast have seen. Mm-hmm. That's even better. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll find out what they're doing with it. Uh, I guess before we dive in, uh, we'll kind of show what we're looking for. The seven tips to a successful pitch deck. Number one, do they identify the business plan goals? Two, do they know their audience? Three, do they understand the market? Four, do they under, do they identify the needs and roadblocks? Five, do they know what sets the business apart? Six, will they introduce the team and product? And seven, will they create a summary? Let's see. So they're a lifestyle brand for personal cannabis storage systems. They have cases and bags, other associated accessories, so direct online and through retailers throughout the U.S. and Canada. Yay, Canada! So they get right to the point. I kind of like that. Um, They get ROI. So the return on investment, it looks like national brand. um, that They're developing $2 million in sales. So not bad. Excellent. That's based on 341000 from uh, initial capital. That's good. At least the sales exceed the initial investment. So they've raised a million in preferred, uh, convertible preferred note. They have pre-money valuation of $5 million, minimum investment of 100000 but uh, they're not pre-money anymore. Yeah, I think that's uh, maybe a, a typo. I think I know what they're trying to say, but... Because right here it says that they have actual revenue of three point two million, so maybe their pre-money valuation was at five. But traditionally, I mean, what's traditional anymore? But uh, traditionally, I think it was a ten x return. So if they were making three point two million, uh, you could try to sell that for uh, what thirty two million. Ten x return is that that unicorn pie in the sky number that used to be traditional. I don't know if traditional exists anymore. Yeah, so they have their story up here. We're not going to really get into that because we're, we're just basically judging the pitch deck and, and how they, they access that. So moving all along, uh, going with the culture here, snowboarding, cannabis, active lifestyle. That's good. You, you agree with that, Josh? <laughs> Absolutely. Cannabis and fitness. And even, yeah. even the black male, you know, and, and snowboarding. Uh, is is good as forward looking, uh, forward thinking. Uh, I see diversity in there, so it's a good picture. I, I like the way they put this together. It looks good. Mm-hmm. Little text heavy, but uh, yeah, it's, that's good. It's long, but you know, it's 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 probably going to give you a lot of information. Investors going to answer a lot of questions, but it is a little wordy. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of visuals and pictures. So if this was a presentation, somebody might be talking about it. Kind of going through and explaining what it is but they're using hemp and they're up recycling um, it's supposed to be smell proof or maybe smell resistant is a better way it's secured because you can lock it so that's nice so if you're at home um, you know you have kids or whatever or even a dog you can lock your stuff up that's a nice consideration it, that is something that a lot of people face and it is not just kids, it's also pets. <laughs> so that's good. So we got some new products uh, as since 2018, um, kind of expanding their line. So they started out with some bags and they went into, looks like um, some pre-roll containers and then either lotions or concentrate packaging. Yeah, or a little stash box. Mm-hmm. Kind of hard to tell from just the picture, but yeah, I've definitely seen those zip bags. Oh, the total addressable market, yay. 
Uh, I don't know how they came to calculate the total addressable market for cannabis storage units um, for a personal cannabis storage unit, but uh, I'm sure there's some market research behind it. We'll break that down to the Canadian market as well. And how much can Stash Logic sell? So the Washington Post reports that nearly 55 million Americans currently use cannabis, and that uh, represents 240 million in sales. That could double over the next four years. They go into competition, uh, distribution. So 29% is online, 15% wholesale, 31% through the distributor, and 25% private label. So why does that private label isn't higher? Because the uh, Super Chronics private labeled some stash uh, lion bags back in the day. Mm. The color, they weren't um, smell proof. They, you know, you can smash it on the ground, whatever your pipe would break. But I think people were really looking for this discreet smell proof option um, all the way back to 2015. Um, I agree. Not just the odor, but also uh, child proof packaging is, is a big deal in the industry. Uh, some states have mandated you can't leave the store without having your purchase in a child-proof package. So maybe that indicates they were ahead of the curve, Josh. Yeah, I, I would think that um, something that's child-proof for a, a, even a pet, like I mentioned, would be nice because then I wouldn't have to spend $710 pumping my dog's stomach uh, when she ate some, some concentrate on the ground <laughs> from like a year ago <laughs> that I totally forgot about. Uh, <laughs> yes, I could see this. I think, I think it's an interesting point in time right now, whereas in 2015, you didn't really think that that federal legalization was going to happen. And now with all of the regulated markets leading up to legalization, we're in this kind of middle stage where you're taking your pre-roll, you're taking your vape pen, you don't really have flour with you that stinks. So maybe this is going to switch to more of an in-home thing where you're locking up for kids and pets or maybe it's, you know, transport. But I, I think we're in a transition period, um, and I still think that there's a use for this, but the time when people would take their stash with them and the bong and everything, like, that's, that's adapted to edibles and vapes and pre-rolls. Um, I mean, the dabbers and stuff even, they, they'll take their rigs and everything too, but I, I definitely feel like we're in a transition period. So it would be interesting to see um, how the, this company pivots to stay relevant. You know, actually, one of their graphics was showing the chocolates in there, emphasizing the childproof nature of, of the of the product. Yeah, right here. So do the math. You have your edibles, you have stash, and the kids don't, don't eat it. So, yeah, substitute the kid for a puppy, and that's my world. Um, but, yes, I think it's a great product for that, for sure. All right, so wholesale, they have 300 accounts, and then they have some distribution as well. Seeing the numbers popping out immediately, but um, private labeling, as we mentioned before, definitely would probably be something that a lot of companies would want to jump on, and that way you can have their um, all of their stuff in one thing. Like, look at the liquor store during the holidays, you know, when you have all these cups and, and accessories and all of that. So, uh, slap a logo on there and put your lighter and all of these things all in one, this little gift bag, you know, sort of private label. Yeah, the private label probably would work very, very well in states like Nevada, where you have to have the childproof packaging to walk out the door. Uh, you could probably sell one of these bags, and then that would also tap into the whole uh, green movement of reusing the same bag over and over again. That That's nice. I like that. Yeah, they've already got Tilray up in Canada on board. so That's a good sign. Mm -hmm. So their Boulder office in Colorado talks about so their operations and their supply chain. They had a shipment of a thousand bags seized by U.S. Customs in 2017. So we've talked about that on this podcast before about ridiculous stuff, bombs and glassware and bags. And wow, that's unfortunate. Even a even a bag. I mean, come on. So they do mention uh, the staff. They mention the products, obviously. So we talked about the inventor and the startup guy, um, everybody who's, who's involved. 
I like that they gave them little nicknames. That's that's it really conveys to the person uh, reviewing the deck what the role is. It gives you some personality too. That there's like a high morale almost, you know. Um, yeah, a team. Definitely, yeah. Some kind of fun nature to it, and it's not um, it's not stupid names or they're fun names. Like there's people who want to make themselves sound interesting and, and big. And then people who just go the stony route. And that was kind of a nice little in between fun, uh, fun name. Yeah. Take a look at the capital sales today, 3.2 million gross margin, 65% and investment capital, uh, 580,000. A lot of investors like to see uh, lean and mean, especially early. Uh, you know, uh, how many pitch decks have we seen? You know, oh, we're going to buy a Lamborghini with your investment money. Uh, and we have seen that. <laughs> so it's nice to know. It wasn't a Lambo, it was an, it was an Audi. <laughs> an Audi. Sorry, that's right. That's right. It was just the clothes that put me over the edge. I, I, I could I could finance his car, but not his clothes. Uh, no, it's good that they um, that they mention that. Again, investors look for that. Yeah. Some of the stuff could be in an appendix to make it less wordy, but you know, we're just flying through it. Uh, mm -hmm. so it's it's structured, um, it's organized well. I would just you know, reiterate that it is longer. Uh, so I would put some of that stuff in, uh, in, the, in the end just to get through it. So we are at the potatoes now with investment opportunity and use of funds. So uh, kind of looking at this there, they're looking for a million dollar raise. It's a convertible preferred stock. If they have milestones that are met, convertible debt note will uh, convert to uh, preferred equity um, at a given point in time, right? So one X liquidation preference, non-participating at five million pre-money valuation, which is sort of irrelevant now that they've been making money. So I'm curious why they keep using that. Um, look for a minimum hundred thousand dollar investment for a convertible note. Looks fairly fairly normal. Um, looks like they're selling board seats. That's new. Well, if you're going to invest in a million a million dollars you are probably entitled to a board seat uh, and that's probably why they phrase it possible board seat uh, but it is good to have clear terms uh, we're raising a million dollars call us up no they they tell you what the terms are it's so good on them this is this is a good sign and I also like the the secondary part of use of funds uh, we we want to have a general idea. Again, this is just a summary. Uh, you know, working capital, three hundred thousand dollars. It doesn't have to be exactly three hundred thousand dollars, but it tells the investor that they've given some thought to what they're going to do with your money, and and that's that's a good guideline. Um, a lot of people forget that step. So you're going to use some of the money for working capital and marketing. Hire a couple of people for product design, supply chain, research and development, and prototyping equipment. I, of course, would advise them to go and do that in Puerto Rico so they can uh, take advantage of Act 20 and get that 50% tax credit on property, plant, and equipment, and only pay 4% corporate tax cap if they want to remain in, uh, in business. Well, there you go, Josh. They even had a, a summary for you. Let's see. Did they make it? Let's check it out. Seven tips to a successful investment deck. Number one is, did they identify the business plan goals? Yes, they did. Uh, very wordily, but they did. Did they know their audience? The investor audience, absolutely. Uh, with the TAM and, and the ROI, and they had all the buzzwords. They had all the little charts you want to see. Um, but like you raised, Josh, do they know the cannabis consumer um, uh, market uh, audience? I, I don't, I don't um, yes and no. <laughs> uh, everybody knows that cannabis smells and everybody knows that you have to secure your cannabis one way or another. Uh, and they do have a product related to that. Uh, but I also question how big that market is. Uh, you're not making it through the airport 
or some police search with this bag. That, that, that's not the point of it. it. It's sort of for the home user that uh, doesn't want their, the clothes in their closet to stink when they only smoke once a week. Uh, and, and yeah, I'm gonna give them three quarters of a point, Josh. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that simply because the market is changing. And so I, I'm not sure if they, they didn't really talk. So we'll get into roadblocks and everything. And I think that should have been there with the change in the marketplace. Um, I know that they, they talked about kids and locking that up for you know, pets as well. But with the market changing, maybe it's more of a transport from the rec shop to home um, rather than going to, because with the opening of cannabis cafes, it's really going to change the game, and I think they needed to address that, and we'll get to that at the fourth point. Moving on to number three, addressing or understanding the market. I guess we, we just talked about that, so we are at number four, identifying needs and roadblocks. What do you think we stand on that? Having a stash box uh, type piece of equipment, uh, it there needs and roadblocks is going to be tough for them. You know, there's no license, although product was apparently seized for no comprehensible reason. Uh, And what I didn't like is two things. First, uh, if you're going to try and hide your weed, this is a little large. Uh, they did have just a little zip envelope, etc. So if you're sort of a teenager and hiding it under the mattress, uh, I am not advocating teenagers to consume cannabis. I am saying if, if that is uh, why you would buy a little uh, a zip envelope type of thing, um, I don't know that you would need this particular thing. So I think their their real sta- standout product is is the little box that holds everything. Uh, and the problem with that is why don't you just go for specialized bong, um, bong carriers or dab rig carriers. Uh, we've seen those at some of these events and, and they can be pretty tricky, pretty intricate, um, to allow the safe transport of your product. And I don't mean smuggling uh, cannabis, I mean glass and and all the accoutrement that go with a dab rig. And they didn't really hit on that, but they did, uh, they, they had a real positive message, child safety and um, uh, storage of your cannabis in your home. That is a topic that uh, a lot of people forget. Uh, but I think the, the roadblock, and we've already discussed this, Josh, is uh, you, have, you have people that, that consume every once in a while. They go buy some pre-rolls, but they're smoking it right there uh, that day. Maybe they're having a party or something, or mom's coming to visit or something. Who knows? But uh, the casual user is not going to purchase this product and the the heavy cannabis user is already past this product and the the soccer mom uh and and your grandma who might be a medical patient uh is isn't going to really be using this product either so i think their roadblocks were addressed tangentially by their silence. I can see older generation soccer moms using it um, out of fear for you know, kids or, or conservative, like they're gonna lock it because they don't want anyone to find it because they're, you know, they don't want anybody to know about it. Having but, said that, there's opportunities to create bags that you know, fit a lifestyle so that, like you mentioned, something that carries a bong or pipe or something but is more of a, like a picnic basket. So you can unzip it and it turns into like a transformer or whatever. All of a sudden it's a, it's a sleeping bag or it's a picnic blanket. You know, I have one of those bags too. It's a carry-on I use and you can literally unzip both ends and it turns into kind of a picnic basket. So you can mm. put different stuff in there. And, and so you can get creative. I think that's where they, they need to go. They're, they have all the fundamentals down. And so they want it a bag, they want it smell proof, they want it convenient and all these things fashionable. Now they kind of need to get really creative with that R&D when they get the capital. Go to Puerto Rico so you can save yourself a ton of money and reinvest that back into 
a creative bag that people want. Because I, I definitely think that you can get there, but with everything shifting and changing, you're going to have to sell something based on not fear, uh, but entertainment. And so if you can provide an experience where, you know, you're incorporating Bluetooth speakers or something like that, I think that this needs to go a lot farther and it could, could go a lot farther. Uh, but they're going to have to figure out how to set themselves apart and being smell proof isn't enough for me. So number five, knowing what sets the business apart, smell proof and locking is great. I think they probably have one of the best products out there. Um, I'm just not sure that with the, there's intrinsic value and with time moving on, that diminishes to the point of zero if they don't continue to be inventive. As far as point number five, setting their business apart, I really like the fact that they're upcycling, that these are natural products. Uh, I, I think that it was a smart, uh, a smart choice instead of, you know, ballistic nylon, <laughs> you know, these types of things. Uh, and, and that was good, but um, they didn't go too much into their competition, given the depth that they went in on the other areas, they didn't really go into it. And maybe Josh, the reason why they didn't go into it is because their competition is a Ziploc bag. Hmm. <laughs> There's a funk sack or stink sack or something like that. Um, I think they were one of Arkham's very first investments and they've gone absolutely nowhere. They changed their name to Dymapack. So they do have competition. It's, it's mostly for retail shops, I think. Um, you know, and then the, the lion bag that I had, he's, you know, he works for like all yacht now. So he's out, of, he's out of the game. A lot of people are out of the game. They don't have a lot of competition. Uh, but I think if they want to improve their sales, it's going to again have to be something based outside of fear and be more inventive uh, with the operations of saving money in a place like Puerto Rico. Right, and they could just totally trick out the bag to be a carry-all for everything. Uh, you know, you, if you, where are you going to put your lighter, and is there a little special thing for the lighter? Okay, well, what about these little blowtorch units, and um, what about all the cleaning stuff that you need? Um, and so maybe the answer for Stash Logics is to amp it up by a factor of 100 and make a highly specialized product with the same features, um, with upcycling uh, and safety, and just go high end. Yeah, they could have novelty products like a rolling station or a, a teeny little rosin press, you know, like just something little you know, like fun that you can do. Um, but I, I think they're going to have to get creative um, in order to stay in this thing long term um, with volume. I think they can do business for, you know, for infinity, just not the volume that, that they ultimately would like. Just high volume, you know, international sales just have to be more creative. Um, so they did, we, we've broken that down, talked about the products. So obviously they did introduce that. They introduced the team with the little nicknames that we, we mentioned. Um, so we'll give a, I guess, a full point for that as well. Absolutely. I like the little nicknames. Um, and uh, it was a little dense, but I, I like the ability to at least be able to look somebody up, uh, at least the main players for the company. What's your experience in this industry? What, what's your experience with cannabis? And I like that. So they, they get a full point for number six. And seven. We yeah, think they created a summary at the end and had a mask and everything. So I'll give them a point for that. Yeah. So number five, did you give them a full point for knowing what sets the business apart? I'm going to give them a half a point for setting the business apart because they have a socially conscious product. And number four, did you give them half a point for identifying needs and roadblocks? <laughs> half a point is a, is a little much, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give them a half a point for number four. Yeah, I don't think they have that at all. So I mean, I guess we could just kind of skip that entirely and give them a five out of seven. That's pretty good. That's not bad. It's a great score. I do have a few general comments about their slides. Um, number one, I really like all of the real life photography. I like that they have a real product. 
Uh, I think that this might be a, a nice product for a video demonstration, maybe in the appendix for an investor, because you know just the picture of it, it, it looks like a fanny pack or a, a fangled type of a fanny pack. And, and I know I've seen it, it's much more than the fanny pack. They give some interior photos. Uh, and the other thing I would say is your pitch deck is very text dense. Uh, I would sort of give some space, cut some of that stuff out. Um, you know, you could start with the total addressable market slide uh, if you want to. If you want to keep your slides to a certain number. Um, but it's very, very dense. And I think a lot of this information could be conveyed otherwise. Um, and then lastly, I would not recommend that, uh, that uh, you do this with someone else's child. Uh, but if you have uh, one of the, uh, if one of the team has a child, give, give the child the thing and let's see, can a child get into it? Uh, you know, if, if your idea is, uh, um, uh, that this is child proof, prove it. And that would be excellent marketing. Yeah, that's a good point because the Kong toys I have with my two pit bulls are not pit bull proof. So <laughs> maybe that's a line too is, is really strong puppy proof, uh, material that could then also be water resistant and activity. I really like the pictures here because it personalizes, it normalizes it. Like you said, it's a fanny pack. It's something that you visually know and recognize and, and understand as something that's normal, <laughs> whether or not you like it or not. Um, it, it is sort of just saying that, that this is an active lifestyle, that they're not couch potatoes, that they're out there with something that's stylish, uh, normal. And so these pictures are, are giving you that experience. And that's a lot of, of pitches in the last five plus years has been – you know, oh, Sally is is got the stash bag, whatever, and, and so they're just trying to give you that experience and personalization, um, rather than an old business school way of just like getting straight to the numbers. These pitches, um, I think, that this deck specifically was intended to kind of have that unique personalization, and then like, a lot of those pictures kind of represent that. So, I'm yeah. looking forward to their pitch event with uh, with Canopy Boulder later on this month in July, uh, as they kind of go and look for that million dollar funding round. So I'll be an investment judge for them. So it's good to kind of get uh, behind the scenes and see what's going on. I'll do the same thing with all the other pitch decks. I think there's 10 total companies over two different days of this month for Canopy Boulder pitch event. So uh, we'll keep you guys posted. I have one piece of advice for Stash Logics. Uh, Uncle Ike's is the largest uh, cannabis retailer in the in the Seattle area, and I was at a trade show with the lead buyer for Uncle Ike's, and just casually, uh, we saw a childproof uh, packaging solution, and uh, it, there was initial excitement. This is great. This is wonderful. We need this. Uh, the, the gut response from that lead buyer was, we need this. Then she took a look at it and she was, she's like, my kid could open this in a minute. So if you are going with the childproof safety route, make sure it is. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah, I don't know why I just got a vision of like a puzzle box. I mean, it's totally outside the realm of what they're doing, but back to the experience of, of a functional and, and nice little stash box, maybe like an interactive puzzle box that's really hard to open. <laughs> maybe you yeah. open it yourself. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you could be. When I'm running really low, I have to go to my, my puzzle box and open up like the last ounce or whatever. And then <laughs> <laughs> you have to be uh, semi-sober just to get into your stash. <laughs> just too annoying to open, and that's how you keep your reserves. And feel like you have to have it. <laughs> yeah, does it float? I mean, they're outside a lot. You know, does it float? Maybe, maybe it's buried in all that text somewhere, but, you know. Yeah, you know. floating is big. We like to float down some rivers here in the West Coast, so maybe that's an option too. But, uh, Absolutely. Yeah.
<laughs> we'll, we'll have an opportunity. Yeah, I, I enjoyed this deck, so thanks, Josh. Yeah, it was good. It's a good thing. So hopefully we'll get some comments. Uh, enough time. We'll have a couple of weeks before the pitch event. So if you have any comments, uh, I will relay them on to uh, Skip, the CEO of Stash Logics. But with that, we're going to roll this one up. I want to thank my guest, Katrina Bogowski, angel investor and attorney in Seattle. Thanks for being back on the podcast. Thanks, Josh. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't head them out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got.